If I come in and say, hey, I spent hundreds of hours taking 103 pages of notes in preparation for this, people are going to value whatever is coming up a lot more than if you don't say that at all. Why is YouTube so hard? It's different from a movie theater. You don't just choose to watch a movie, walk in, and you're in for two hours. You click on YouTube, there's like a huge sidebar of lots of other videos begging to be clicked right next to you. So you're not like Alex Hormozzi mm -hmm. says no to all his friends and family. My whole motto is create a life you love making videos you love. If you're not going to be clickbaity, then how do you get clicks? If I knew what I knew now, I would have taken down that video as soon as it started blowing up because... What is an income a new YouTube creator can expect when they first start out? Dollars. I wanted to talk shorts. Is there a reason you don't make them? I don't want to have beef with Jenny. <laughs> so, like, I know it's a lot easier to monetize an audience with long form content, even if it's a smaller audience. What do you think of Diary of a CEO thumbnails? If I were to talk to Steven, I'd be like, hey, bro, we got to talk about your titles here. How often do you change your title and thumbnails? There have been cases studies done where on the thumbnail they have a picture of a person but it's not clear that it's an interview there's no microphone and they might click off because they were expecting the video essay how much of this was conscious as you were creating the thumbnail and how much of it was after it did well i realize i'm not the main character here unfortunately i'm not famous enough so that my face can just drive a tons of clicks all the time but instead the main curiosity driver here is in today's episode, we're talking to April Lynn Alter, a successful YouTuber known for her expertise in growing a YouTube channel from scratch. We'll cover what it takes to get monetized on YouTube and the top ingredients you need to make a viral long form video. Stick till the end to learn how to nail the first five seconds of your video and why Diary of a CEO needs to upgrade its title game. April Lynn, why is YouTube so hard? <laughs> Oh my gosh. That's like a golden question, right? Because you, a lot of people come in. I mean, I certainly came in and thought like, oh, it's it's YouTube. Like how, how hard it can, can it be? And then you start like the more you learn, the more you learn what you don't know. And then like all of a sudden it, it, it gets out of hand very, very quickly. I think the real reason why YouTube is hard is because I mean, it's, it's, it's human behavior, right? Like everything about YouTube comes down to the audience and your viewers and what they like and what they don't like. And especially as YouTube becomes more and more competitive and more and more people getting onto the platform, it's becoming harder than ever to even stand out in the first place. So now you have to, they're kind of two sides of it, right? You have to come up with a video concept that is interesting, informative, engaging, whatever, enough for human beings to watch it and like it. And you have to stand out enough from the crowd in the first place to even be noticed, for, for people to even watch your video. So they're like these two very large problems uh, that are pretty complex to try to solve. So that's probably why YouTube is hard. Yeah, yeah I, I had a, when, I, when we started our first YouTube channel, uh, that my that was my thought as well. Like, how hard can YouTube be? You just <laughs> you just you know, film yourself on your phone and put it out there, and, and that, that's it. And um, you know, four years later, still haven't been able to crack fifty thousand subs. So, <laughs> yeah. So, what are we all doing wrong? I mean, I think I think like it goes it goes back to those two two kind of problems of YouTube, right? So, how how do you make good content that's really the execution of the content mm -hmm. and how do you stand out in the first place um and both of those things again you can i could talk literally forever about uh each of these two different sides of the equation i'd say like in a very broad level right when you come to the you know will people click and will people watch it's kind of what it all boils down into when it comes to will people click uh, I feel like that's where a lot of people go wrong is in terms of, we use the word packaging, which is kind of your, your initial idea, title, and thumbnail. So what is your initial idea for a video? And then how do you package it with your title and thumbnail in a way that is the most clickable? When it comes up in someone's home screen, they want to click on it. That's where a lot of people can go wrong. Is there are a lot of pitfalls we can go into here. And it's very easy to become either, you know, either turn people off with your packaging or just be invisible, right? Just not stand out enough for people to click on you in the first place. And there's a lot that you can do with your title and thumbnail 
to kind of break through that noise, to disrupt that pattern, to stand out enough for people to notice you in the first place and then get that click. And then when it goes into the execution side, will people watch? Then you start to get into things like retention. So like if people do click on it, how long are they watching for? Is it engaging or informative enough to for them to continue watching and not click off? Do they enjoy watching it? Like, is it a good video? Is the audio enough so that's not grating on their ears and they want to, to click off? You know, is it visually appealing enough so that they, that they don't get bored? The really unique thing about YouTube as well is that whenever someone clicks, it's different from a movie theater. You don't just choose to watch a movie, walk in, and you're just in for two hours. You click on YouTube, and there's like a huge sidebar of lots of other videos just begging to be clicked right next to you. That at any one point, if someone gets bored, they can very easily just click to something else. So how do you make sure that they stay engaged and interested throughout the entire video itself? Yeah, that's interesting. I, I was watching your how to make a killer YouTube thumbnail video. And one thing that stood out was like how much time you spend um, preparing for that video. Can you mm -hmm. talk a little bit more about that as well? Yeah, gosh. Um, a lot goes into my videos, and I think that's uh, it's a great opportunity to bring up something I like to talk about a lot. I love talking about this, and it's called input bias. So input bias is the idea that the more effort you put into something, whether that's time or energy or money, then the more people will value it. And I love to kind of like front load in videos as soon as I can what effort I put into videos, right? If I come in and say, hey, I spent hundreds of hours taking... 103 pages of notes in preparation for this, people are going to value whatever is coming up a lot more than if you don't say that at all. Um, everyone's process for what input bias looks like to them is going to be different. And it kind of depends on like what your own resources are and what your own strengths are. For me, a lot of my own particular skill sets fall into kind of like my research capabilities. So my ability to, what I say like, uh, collect and connect information nodes. So collect a lot of nodes of information and then connect them to each other, um, as well as being able to distill something that's very complex into something that's a little bit more accessible and easy to understand. And so those are kind of two of my strengths that I like to lead by. Um, and by extension, it's like, okay, when it comes to how do I want to leverage input bias, for me, that shows up into, can I do more research than anyone else? Can I make a video on a topic that is more comprehensive than anyone else? So my process looks something like come up with a video idea. Um, there's like some sort of some area of YouTube or facet of YouTube that I want to cover, like an intro or like a thumbnail. And then I go into like research April in mode where like all I do is just consume lots of different sources of information and just have like a master document going on where I just put in all of my notes. Then I go into outline April in mode where I take that gigantic document and start to like crunch it into like distill into what's coming up a lot, what is not as relevant, what's the most relevant. And what I love to do is like take things and put them into frameworks. So kind of in this outline April in crunch phase, I'll take my gigantic chaotic document and start to form it into a framework. Once I have my framework, then the script writing process starts. Um, and then like the rest, I can, I can kind of go into all of that, but I think that's really what tends to set a lot of my videos apart is in that initial kind of prep phase. Bef right. Before you dive in your, into your questions, I just quickly want to ask, how long does one video take you to produce? The The cop-out answer is it depends. Uh, the better answer is as however long I give it. Um, the whole like quality versus quantity debate is something I like to play with as like a lever, right? And so like each of these things can be adjusted. And I've, I've made videos in three days. I've made videos in three months. Um, so it's something that I like to play with and adjust based off of, off of what my own goals are at a certain, at a, at a given point. Um, my intro video that was kind of like my breakout video uh, took me around two and a half weeks to make. The one following that, the thumbnail video, took me around three months to make. Um, and the one that I'm working on now, it, it will definitely not take three months. It'll take a lot less time than that. I'm about, I want to say one week into it so far. Uh, and 
I'm, I, I have more deadlines for myself. Um, and now, of course, these chunks of time are broken up. It's not me like three months straight working on something towards the end of last year when I was working the thumbnail videos. Like there was a lot of travel, right? So there was like birthdays and Thanksgiving and Christmas and New Year's and lots of different like, countries that we were going to. So it, was, it wasn't three months straight. But yeah, I think going into this new year, I do have a goal that I want to become... I want the cadence of my videos to be quicker. So I want to upload, I want to say maybe three videos every two months is my goal moving forward. So you're not like Alex Hormozzi, <laughs> which says no to all his fr friends and family, <laughs> just stays home and work. <laughs> um, I, I definitely do get into like workaholic sprint modes. Um, I do I do like those, right? Like, where all I kind of do is just sit down and go ham. Um, but I also, like, and we, we, we kind of get into this later, but I'll, my whole motto is create a life you love making videos you love, right? And it's like, okay, if you are, if you are so caught up in the making videos part that you no longer have a life that you love, that's kind of defeating the whole purpose in the first place. And so I think that there definitely can be a balance of enjoying the process and like you know i've gone through a major period of burnout from content in the past and from that experience i never want to go through that again because that destroyed me for a significant period of time so i want to make sure that i can keep up my quality of content love the content that i create and love the process every step of the way as i make this content right uh, yeah i know so we we have the question saved for you why you stop your earlier channel the nft channel so we'll we'll get to that but um, I, so the first time I saw one of your videos, you mentioned, oh, I spent like 150 hours researching for this topic. And I was like, I, I, I don't believe you. But then, then you actually showed the B-roll of your master document where you scroll through really quickly. And I actually paused it right there. And I was like, is that, is that like a real document or are you just using some random uh, document that makes absolutely no sense? And it was actually your real notes. Yeah. And I paused it again after one second. And then I paused it again after one second. It was like real, actual real notes. Like, I was like, that's crazy. She actually did spend that much time. Do you, uh, so like, I'm curious to know, do you actually plan to share that master document with the public or is that just for you? It's something that I've, I've been asked a few times and then I thought about. Um, and it's interesting because on one side, it's like, I think like, uh, way back before I started kind of like my blow up on this channel, um, in like one of my old Mr. Beast related videos where like, I also have like a master doc about like, uh, research when I watched all of Mr. Beast interviews and just like consume everything and cut off him. Um, someone emailed me out of the blue and asked like if he could buy that document. I was like, $500 <laughs> and it's yours. And he was like, okay. And then I got 500 bucks and then he had that. And so that, that was, that was interesting. Um, well, I definitely maybe you should have charged more. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so like the, the, the big question for me though, was like, okay, like what it's, it's, we kind of get into like what different like skill sets are and, uh, entries to barrier barriers to entry. Um, and when you make a lot of your content, a lot of it comes from like you being special, right? And like you not wanting your content to be replaceable. And for my particular content, part of the barrier to entry to creating my specific type of content is that amount of work that goes into it, right? It's like not everyone has hundreds of hours that they can spend researching. And also my own research capability too, I'm able to get more done in let's say 150 hours than someone else can get done in 150 hours of researching just because it's my particular skill set. So that's like a pretty high barrier of entry to my type of content. But if this becomes for sale, then the barrier of entry for this type of content is no longer 150 hours of research. Now it's, do you have $500? And it's a lot easier to get $500 than it is to have 150 hours to spend researching something. Now, of course, it's not like a one-to-one, -one, which is why you want to have barriers to entry across multiple different axes. Like, yes, you can have the research, but can you condense into like a framework like I can? Or, you know, like, but can you write the sort of script that I can? Or can you like create the visuals that I can and the animations that I can and all of this? And for most people, the answer is no, you can't, which is why I like to like stack, again, stack these skills, stack different barriers to entry. Um, 
But yeah, it's like an overall question that I ask myself of like, is it worth it for the extra money? Maybe, maybe not. Something that I have to think about. Yeah, interesting. I actually actually wanted to the the concept of input bias is is fascinating to me as well. But uh, I'm sure a lot of people watching this will think to themselves, how can they apply input bias to their style of video? Like so, mm-hmm. um, like for example, for us, like this podcast. How do you apply input bias to this podcast? Okay, so if we dial back input bias to its barest forms, right? So the more effort you put you put into something, the more people will value it. That can be time, energy, money. And so when you think about this podcast, right? Like how can you show input bias? One one can be, you know, how many how many hours of research did you do into that guest, right? Like how prepared are you like for their interview? Did you watch all of, you know, X number of hours of their stuff to to prepare for that? Or how many notes do you have? You could also show it through your editing, right? Like if that's if that's like a axis that you want to play into, could like in your intro, could like the level of editing for that intro for your podcast be higher? Um, a lot, a lot of podcasts now, as opposed to just having the 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 a roll of the back and forth between the guests and you you have different like animations or things come up like key takeaways that pop up throughout the podcast itself right so it's kind of showing this increased level it's not just someone with the microphone it's this plus like different layers of editing that it can put on top of that um so those are like kind of two ways that you could leverage input bias if you wanted to with your podcast or kind of like anything else you could think of in terms of how much work are you putting into this and how can you show that work? And that's the biggest right. thing. It's like, are you putting in the work? And then how can you show that work? Right. And you mentioned that the input bias, you want to front load it. You want to show it in the first 30 seconds or so. Mm-hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, if, if, if you can, right? So it's like, that's that's when you should front load this input bias. Like anything that you want to really highlight, that should come up in the first 30 seconds. That's part of convincing someone to watch after they click, right? They click and you have, you know, just a few seconds, around like 20-ish seconds to convince them, hey, I should keep watching versus, eh, not my cup of tea, I'll go and click on a different video. So try to put as much as you can, front load all of that in the beginning, but then, you know, don't just leave it like that, right? The, the, the beginning should set the tone for what the rest of your video should look like. And so it's like, you know, if you're trying to, if you want it to be a little higher, higher edited, right? It's like, okay, the beginning should be the most edited piece, but you should also have extra editing throughout the video itself as opposed to just like completely bare. It just, it just set the same tone in a similar way of like, you know, if, if you go into a movie expecting an action adventure movie, and the first third, like the first couple minutes of the movie is action adventure, and then it turns into like a steamy romance. Like you're probably gonna walk out of the theater because it's just not what you were expecting from how it was advertised and from the first couple of minutes were. Yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Erica, what are your thoughts on like how are you gonna implement that on your property videos for your real estate challenge channel? Well, I think the property vi- videos maintain a consistent quality throughout. I mean, they're they're fairly similar. So they're also only a minute twenty seconds. Right, right. But you know, for this podcast, I mean, maybe we should think about ad- adding some animation. Oh yeah. So actually, that brings up another point. Um, so in one of your videos, you mentioned the intros have to be like thirty seconds or so. Like I think you were using Mr. Beast's examples, where his his videos are like twenty minutes, and he he would d- do his intro and like get to the action within like the first 20 to 30 seconds. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to understand, and you do something similar in your videos, correct? Depends on the type of video, but yes, overall, yes. Right. So one of the questions I had was like, when you have a longer form, like one hour, 20 minutes, one hour, 30 minute interview on a podcast, um, and and I like, like to do intros for like maybe in a minute and a half, is that is that too much or should I stick to the same 30 seconds? What are your thoughts? For I mean, it 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 definitely flexes with video length. Um, right. So it's like it, in the same way that a 20 second intro in a five minute video was probably too much, right? Because it's like, okay, that's that a significant portion of your entire video is just your intro. Same with like, okay, if it's an hour and a half long podcast, 
20 seconds, like it, you, you can have a longer intro. People are expecting it almost like with a longer form content. It's like, okay, yeah, it's a one and a half to two hour long podcast. It makes sense if the intro is going to be a tad longer to, you know, fully set the proper context, right? Into this longer conversation that you're having. And again, like to hit on the promise, there's like a lot about like, you know, the hook or opening a curiosity gap or starting with a promise, whatever terminology you want is you set up something and then there's progress and payoff. And usually the, the entire cadence of the entire video is multiple setups, progressions, and payoffs. Set up, progression, payoff. Set up, progression, payoff, and kind of continue to do that throughout the video, as well as usually one overarching um, for the entire video itself. And for like a longer form podcast, there's a lot more content there. So it makes sense that there's a lot more to be paid off. So there can be a little bit more setup in the beginning to give the proper context for whatever promise it is that you're going to eventually pay off in the end, if that makes sense. Yeah. So speaking of intros, maybe we should break down all the elements of what makes a good intro. Yeah, oh, yeah. Things yeah. like foreshadow. Right. We're talking about the curiosity gap, all of that. Yeah. And I, I know you mentioned that first five seconds are really, really important. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk about that as well? First five seconds of your intro. Um, and I think this is usually the same for everyone. As soon as someone clicks on the video, you like essentially, okay, stepping back, your title and thumbnail set the expectations for what the video is going to be. And in the first five seconds, I think this is the same for everyone, you want to meet and hopefully exceed those expectations set in the like from your title and thumbnail. At the very least, you want to meet the expectations set by your title and thumbnail. What does it mean to meet the expectations set by, by your title and thumbnail? You can do it in a couple of ways. Essentially, like bigger picture, it's like when someone clicks on your title and thumbnail, what are they clicking for? What is their expectation for the video? And then how can you assure them when they click on it that this is what they're going to get? More tangibly, this can often show up as, hey, whatever your title is, can you turn that into like a sentence form? And that's maybe a first sentence of your video because it shows them, hey, this is exactly what I'm getting here, right? When it comes to a, a, a thumbnail, it's like, what does the thumbnail look like? Can you have a shot similar to what your thumbnail looks like as the first shot of your video to show them that this is what they're going to get? This happens in podcasts a lot, actually. There's there's like, there, there, there have been case studies done where on the thumbnail, they have a picture of a person, but it's not clear that it's an interview, right? There, there's no microphone in this, right? It, 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 it could look like a video essay. And then people click on it and they realize, oh, this is an interview. And they might click off because they were expecting a video essay. Versus if you put like a microphone, even if it's an edited microphone right up against their face in the thumbnail, people know going into it, oh, this is an interview. So when they click on it and get an interview, their expectations are matched. So whatever they clicked for, they are getting. And you can do that if you're good in the first five seconds of your video. Oh, that's interesting. That's an, yeah, that's I an interesting point. That. <laughs> although, although you could but theoretically... We, we did get a comment once, right? Someone saying, oh, I didn't realize that this was an interview. Usually. Yeah. No, that's what I was thinking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, one Another way would be to add the keyword interview in the title itself, right? Yeah, for sure. You 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 could. Um, and a, lo a lot of people do do that. It kind of depends on like what you want to use your title characters for, kind of like getting slightly into titles. The shorter, in general, you want your title to be fully seen. Um, if it gets above like 53-ish characters, 55-ish characters, um, sometimes 50 characters, depending on what those characters are, you'll see like a dot, 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 where... Right. The entire thing isn't shown. And so, you know, interview is a longer word, right? So as long as you can fit whatever you want your title to be in those characters with the word interview, then for sure you, you can include it there. Um, but if you wanted to like save that space, an easy way to subliminally register and like set that expectation that it's an interview is just gonna having that microphone very like clearly shown in your thumbnail. Right. I also noticed a lot of bigger YouTubers, they they use this formula for the title. They'll say, they'll say, I did this, I interviewed this person, or I spent 50 hours here, right? And so that is an example of a simple title. But then there's counter advice 
which says it also needs to be interesting enough. So, for example, um, which title is better? I interviewed the top real estate agent in the United States or how to be a top real estate agent? It. I think like it, it 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 depends on a couple of things. One is it depends on your audience. Like what specifically are they looking for? Um, and kind of like what job are they hoping to get? Like what like what job do they have that this video will fulfill for them? If I think about the title how to be a successful real estate agent, right? I'm expecting more of like a a, t a tutorial, right? We're like, okay someone's going to like sit me down. They're going to have certain steps. They're going to walk through certain things. It's going to be like a breakdown format or a talking head format versus if it's like I talked to this guy or this, this girl, right? I'm expecting there's going to be more personal elements to it, right? So I'm not going to get like that specific how to with all that steps probably, but I'm going to learn much more from someone's individual experience. And those two things are separate. Which one is better? You kind of get into like what is the overall like what's your goal of the video and who was your desired audience for this video right like if if you want if your desired audience are people who you know m maybe they want denser information as well kind of like that's like a, a difference that i think too when you have like a talking head sort of like tutorial type of thing it's going to be denser so people are probably going to be wanting to take notes along with this if they want to they're sitting down for a specific session for a specific goal versus if you know the i tried one comes on they might be like you know chilling out lunch and they see this come out and they don't need to sit down and take notes they can still kind of just absorb the information because it's going to be a little bit more casual not quite as dense of a conversation because it's a conversation with someone a back and forth as opposed to like very specific outline steps Do, does that make sense there like what what the difference yeah, yeah. Like, and expectations are between those two different title formats yeah yeah, yeah. no it makes sense i actually wanted to share the screen and look at some of your thumbnails okay. and ask questions on that yeah. if, if you're okay with it. Absolutely. Yeah, we did this with uh, Jenny Hoyos and everyone in the comments, they they loved it. So I thought oh, I'll awesome. do that. Yeah. Nice. One of the questions I had was, so I really like the for the over overachievers of YouTube thumbnail, mm -hmm. but then on this, how to make a killer thumbnail uh, video, I, I kind of, thought that your face was too small like one of the advice you give in, in the video is like oh faces attract clicks um and you know you want to make sure the face needs to be large enough for like a mobile device so i was curious to know why you chose this particular thumbnail where you kept your face really small yeah so what, what what you're getting into specifically when that within that video I talked about scroll stoppers and so there are different things that you know our brains are biologically wired to pay more attention to which is really important because again if you think about how much potential content you have bombarded at you at all times um the more you can like stop someone in their tracks the better right because if, if you stop that scroll people like are interested enough subliminally to even just like pause that mindless scrolling they have the opportunity to look at your title and thumbnail more and then decide to click so that's kind of the flow there and the cool thing about scroll stoppers is that there are different scroll stoppers that you can choose from. Now, you're probably not going to use all of them that I mentioned within scroll stoppers. Is there's, there's a lot. There's like danger in movement. There's bright colors. Yes, there's there, there's faces. Anything else with, with familiarity bias, like familiar UIs or UXs as well. There's displays of emotion. So there, there are like a lot of different things that you can put there. There's like money, I think, in like large, large numbers or, or other ones of them. And you're probably not going to put all of these all in one thumbnail or it's going to get like very busy very quickly. Um, but you can kind of choose which ones you want to go through. In those thumbnails, I specifically chose to not use the uh, like use the scroll stopper of faces for a couple of reasons. One was that the one the the video directly before that, so kind of the first in my how to make a killer video series, the intro one did very, very well. Obviously top performer on the channel. Um, my most viewed video on this channel. And that particular thumbnail, that first one stood out for a couple of reasons. But one of my favorite reasons goes into something called contrast. Um, and when you think about all the different types of videos within the YouTube education space, 
there is kind of like a format that's been used a lot. They're typically a darker background, darker colors. The color red is used a lot because it's associated with YouTube. There's usually like a giant face on it or a giant graph on it or both. Um, and those, maybe like some giant words, those are typically used a lot within the space. Um, and that particular first one that popped off, one of the reasons why I did so was because of the contrast, not just within the video itself, but against the other ones. While the other videos are, are more maximalist and darker, this video is a lighter background and more minimalistic. And so kind of within the entire spectrum of people watching YouTube education content, that one stands out to them because it's different. And then you get into the idea of familiarity bias as well, which is the idea that people are attracted to things that they're familiar with. Now, this is like a big case with a lot of Mr. Beast videos, right? It's like this gigantic face, right? Why a lot of larger creators had an advantage. You can get away with more things that smaller creators can't because people see that and recognize them. They're more likely to click just because they see like Ryan Trahan versus someone who was an exact Ryan Trahan thumbnail, but not Ryan Trahan. And for me, it's like, okay, I know a lot of people loved that killer YouTube intro video. And a lot of people like, are still watching that video. Can I make another video that triggers familiarity bias, not really on my face with the fact that it's my face, but the same style of thumbnail? So they recognize the old style. They see this new one and think, oh yeah, that's that one girl who made that one video. I kind of remember this. I know I liked it. So I'm going to click on this one next. And the cool thing about coming up with like a specific form, like format or structure that's unique to you is now every single other video that I make within this How to Make a Killer video series are going to be a very similar structure. So there's also, I guess like last thing I'll say before I'll pause here is the idea of like, what is the main character versus side character like or supporting characters of a thumbnail? The main character is a thing that's going to like is the source of the curiosity gap. So that's the source of why people are clicking in the first place. A classic example is like um, there is this this Mark Rober video where like he's holding up this weird con contra baseball contraption he made where it's a baseball that he like made that was supposed to like uh, evade people's pitches a lot better and so he's holding up and a, a, the the curiosity driver of this of this video in general is this cool contraption he made it's the novelty of this thing and some people would you know they think oh faces are good let me put my face here and like the thing right here but then you are now becoming the main character because you are bigger and taking up more space and everything else all of the attention is being focused on you. And yes, you do have the, the scroll stopper of a face, but usually that scroll stopper of a face isn't strong enough alone to, draw, to stop the scroll and to drive the click, um, especially because everyone else is using their gigantic faces as well. Versus if you lead with the novel thing, so if my face is in the background, I'm holding the cool baseball up, up front up here, that is going to stop your scroll. You'll see something very novel. You'll stop your scroll. You'll click on it because of that, as opposed to the main character being yourself. Going back to this thumbnail, I realize I'm not the main character here. I'm not, unfortunately, I'm not famous enough so that my face can just drive a tons of clicks all the time. But instead, the main curiosity driver here is how do I make that one special thumbnail? So then for me, it's like, okay, how can I visualize a very special thumbnail that stands out from the crowd, that's really what's drawing all of the attention. So when you see that, yeah, I'm small. I'm still there. I'm small. But where am I looking? I'm looking up at the main curiosity driver. And really, you can see all the elements are really put there to drive the most attention to that thing, right? It is brightly colored compared to everything else. It's slightly larger than everything else. It has a glow and it has a little like cursor over it. And I'm looking at it and it's more central, right? And so all of these things, I'm being, all of your attention is being kind of like filtered into that one thing, that one special thumbnail, which my thinking was like, that's the main thing that's going to drive this click in the first place. So I, a lot that I got yeah. you there, but yes. Yeah, that's I, fine. Yeah. And that's yeah, that was, that's a lot of thought that goes into a thumbnail. I'm curious. So for the the first one you did in this series, the how to make a killer intro, how much of this was conscious as you were creating the thumbnail, and how much of it was after it did well? You went back and analyzed what went right 
and, you know, figured it out. Yeah, that for sure. That 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 was definitely an experiment for me, which is all something that mm-hmm. I I wanted to like take a second to talk about um, in terms of finding the right packaging because it's so easy to just look at okay, what is everyone else doing? Mm-hmm. I should do that. It's working for them. It'll work for me. But my experience has been the opposite actually. When I try to do what other people are doing, it doesn't it doesn't work very well. I don't get that 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 many clicks. I don't get that many views. But so so as a result, I was like, you know what? I'm going to stop trying to do what everyone else is doing. I'm going to try to do something different. I really like the idea of a more like minimalistic thumbnail. So I wanted to do something that was a bit more minimalistic in general. Um, a lot of people were doing darker, so I wanted to, to do something lighter. Um, and the main thing for that is the main idea that I had in my head for the thumbnail for my intro was how do I visually represent an intro? And the idea that immediately popped into my head was, well, a video timeline right? You have the one part that's the intro and the rest that's not. I was like, well, I can't just put the entire thing there because no one's going to understand it. So I have to cut off the the intro part. Sure. But it's still not enough. Let's make it a different color. Cool. And then it's like, well, let's like continue to draw more attention to it if I can. That's when the arrow comes in and I'm there, but I'm looking in that direction. So all of those things were conscious choices. Uh, But I will say, I didn't know that it was going to work until it did and then it worked and i was like ah yes i have done it i've cracked the code um like enough to be able to make another thumbnail and you can see again like huge outperformer on my channel uh soon to be i guess the second most third third most viewed coming up soon um and yeah it's like it's a similar thing and for me it's really awesome once you can unlock a repeatable thumbnail or title structure for your channel because you can like that's unique to you because you can start doing it with a lot more um like it puts a further constraint into your thumbnail and title ideation process which is a lot easier to going into versus like blank page what do i do with this right i'm curious to know why not make all thumbnails on your channel like this because i want to save that for that specific how to make a killer video series and so there's a number of videos that i'm making now that i'm working like i'm I'm working on how to come up with a killer youtube idea to blow up your channel and that's like it's going to be a similar title because and, and thumbnail because the video itself is going to be a similar structure a very similar thing where i go through i spend hundreds of hours researching i come up with a document the one that i'm working on now is 109 pages long and counting and i go through my process to make this particular type of video and that's a particular type of video so this is how it's now become like a bucket of content and i want people to start to like associate those things they see this thumbnail concept they see this title structure they immediately understand, again, we go back to expectation setting. They immediately get this expectation. I am going to get an April in video that's going to be very deep and tangible and tactical and accessible about this thing. There, she's gonna uh, approach it with a little bit more empathy than most YouTube educators do, and probably just like a tiny bit of humor in there as well. And then that's what they'll get. And those expectations will hopefully be, hopefully be exceeded because they'll I'll hopefully be able to hit them with a lot more information than they ever dreamed of. Um, and I always get to like end with that giant infographic that I make so they can have that to save for their own references as well. And But I don't want to like make this title and thumbnail structure for other types of videos that are not that type. When they'll click on it, expect a giant breakdown video like my other ones are, but they'll get something completely different. Yeah, makes sense. I was also thinking if you're going for really minimalistic, um, why not just replace the gray background with like completely white so that it like <laughs> it's just your your face and and then the elements on the top. Did you think about that? Yeah, I so what what I want to make sure is that the entire thumbnail is visible across both dark mode and light mode of YouTube. Uh, and so I, I I didn't want it to just completely blend into the background in light mode of YouTube because then it wouldn't really be seen. There's not as much like give body to the right. thumbnail. It's kind of like just me and that people could think like it's a mistake or it's not properly rendered um, versus if the entire thing is kind of this like gray gradient, it's oh, it's a very, this is a thumbnail. This is like an intentional thumbnail. It's not drawing attention to itself at all, but it's just like it's there. You, you can recognize it as a thumbnail versus as like, what is yeah. 
That makes sense. Do you do do all your thumbnails yourself from start to finish or do you have someone who helps you? Nope. I do it all myself. I'm curious to know, what do you think of uh, diary of a CEO thumbnails? Because those are the ones that we try to emulate um, for our channel. Um, I know like one of one, one of the things that, really bugs me is that their titles are usually ridiculously long yes. and I don't know why they don't listen to you <laughs> or like people like Mr. Beast. But I'm curious to know your thoughts, your take on it. On their thumbnails? Yeah. Thumbnails and titles. Title. Okay. I'll, I'll start with thumbnails. Something Diary of a CEO has done really, really well is they have a very instantly recognizable branding, right? And so you, you look at this and if you are a Diary of a CEO, fan, you see this and you immediately recognize, okay, this is another Diary of a CEO video. Awesome. If you've liked them before, you're probably going to click on another one. Um, and so that's that's already like a point in their favor. A lot of their curiosity comes from, um, I guess like if, if, if you think about like why people would click on an interview in general. Usually it's because of one of two things. Either one, they really like the guest and they want they're coming for the guest, or two, they really love the topic and they want to learn more about the topic. And what Direct Diary of a CEO does is kind of like has both of those within his thumbnail, right? You have a picture of the guest. So if you happen to know the guest, cool. That's like that's a faces and familiarity bias right there, right? You see the guest, you want to click. If you don't know that the, who the guest is, you have this quote. And the quote is really interesting because it's like, can you pull one quote from the interview that gives someone a reason to click? Now, a lot of like, there, there is some, it's, it's a, there is like a question of like, how clickbaity do you want to be? And a really interesting thing about Diary of a CEO, like thumbnails and titles, I would say, is that they're not necessarily representative of the entire interview, right? They might, what they tend to do is like pick the one that is the most either like controversial or remarkable, remarkable being quite literally, you see this and someone makes a remark on it, right? Like uh, an example, like, you know, if I say I hung up a painting today, you could be like, cool. You might ask what was the painting of? That's like about as much follow-up as you'll get. Versus if I tell you, hey, I went on a date with a robot today. You'll be like, wait, what? And you'll have like a number of follow-up questions that instantly (laughs) pop up in your head. Like, why? What was it like? Are you okay? You know, just like other questions you'll have. And what what Diary CEO does is that they make sure that their whatever quote they choose is truly remarkable, right? It's something that, you know, men, let, let's see this first one. Men should not split the bill. Okay, that is controversial, right? If you think about a lot of people have very, uh, very specific and strongly held beliefs about this thing. And so by coming up with this, you know, remarkable statement, people will make remarks about it. And so they're more likely to click either to be like, yes, I agree. I want to see what she has to say or no, this is BS. How could she say that? And then click and try to like find where in the interview she talks about this thing. And so it's very good at like getting the click in the first place. Now in terms of like whether or not you want to do that for your own podcast, how far into the like clickbaity controversialness of these quotes you want to lean into versus not is a matter of branding um, and like where you want to fall within your own branding of your own podcast. Yeah, I mean, that's the question we ask ourselves. I mean, we right now we're trying to blatantly copy their strategy. Like if I... (laughs) Well, I guess guess the question is, if you're not going to be clickbaity, then how do you get clicks? (laughs) <laughs> well, it, 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 goes, it goes into like, you know, what are people interested in? There, there, there are different ways of driving interest or driving curiosity, right? And so like one, one could be something that is controversial. We know that things that are controversial drives clicks because for that reason, right? People want to either click to confirm their opinion because they want to feel validated or they click because they want to fight because they do not agree with what's going on. But that's only one type of way to evoke or elicit a click or to get someone interested. There's an entire notion of like a curiosity gap, which is, you know, can you like 
open a loop, can you start a story or a question or something that leaves some sort of information open, right? Where people see that and it leaves like an itch in the back of their brain and they really need to click to get the answer to. Um, one example is like if you promise a nice result. So for me, it's like how to make a killer YouTube intro to blow up your channel. People really want this result. They either really want to blow up their channel or they really want to make a good intro. And so it leaves this like this, this curiosity gap open. I'm introducing this thing and they want to know how to get this thing, right? And as long as I'm able to uh, deliver on that, which hopefully I'm able to de deliver in m my videos, uh, people click on it and they learn and they feel good, right? It's not clickbait to them because something was promised and they get that promise. There are other ways in which you can evoke curiosity more invoke interest, right? Another one is to like show a specific moment right before a very powerful reaction. Um, there, there's like one classic thumbnail that I'm thinking of in my brain right now, which is like this, this white guy who knows how to speak fluent Chinese. And so he's like sitting in like a Chinese restaurant. Um, and like, there's a, a reaction of this like waitress or someone next to him and there's like her face is really blown up and it's like a very shocked expression right and you know the the title is something of, 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 along the lines of like you know white guy like speaks chinese like in a in a chinese restaurant or something um and people click for that exact moment right they know what's coming they want to see this exact moment that happens. They want to see what this powerful reaction is going to be. They want to experience it in some sort of way. That's another reason why you could get something to click. And a last one that I'll mention, because there, there are a whole bunch here. Um, a last one that I'll mention is novelty, right? People are attracted to things that they haven't gotten to experience themselves before, especially if it's something that, that they've wanted to do, but haven't done for whatever reasons. Uh, Mr. Beast does this a lot, right? Like $1 versus $1 billion yacht or a $100,000 hotel or whatever, right? It's like, you want to click on it, not because of like something controversial that's happening here, but because it's so novel, the idea of like a $100,000 hotel or something, hotel room, you know that you'll never be able to afford that, but you want to experience just a little bit of what that's like. So you'll click on that. And so TLDR is that there are a lot of different ways of generating curiosity or generating interest. Being controversial is just one of those methods. Doesn't have to be yours. Right. Um, another thing I wanted to ask you uh, that I learned from your, one of your videos was you mentioned that the titles and thumbnails, they need, the titles need to be additive. Um, can you explain that concept? Yeah, so titles need to be additive, and so like especially when it comes to t thumbnail text. So what a lot of people will do, like a, a common mistake that I see is, you know, let, let's say your title is how to become a, su a successful real estate agent, and then the uh, thumbnail is like a guy and like a checklist or something, and above him is the text how to be a successful real estate agent, and it's like that's not additive. That is the exact same thing as what your title is. And you should avoid doing this because one, like it just adds like, I mean, it adds additional clutter to your thumbnail without it being, without it adding anything new. So it only detracts from it. Um, so instead it's like, what sort of, if you do choose to include text, one, you don't have to include text in your thumbnails if you don't want to, but if you do include text in your thumbnails, it should be something that is additive to the overall story that your title and thumbnail are trying to tell, right? So it's like how to be a successful real estate agent. Um, you could have like a guy holding like a gigantic like whiteboard or something with like a huge checklist and like lots of annotations. Um, and at, at, the, at the top of it can be like, you know, five step framework, right? Then, okay, hey, there's text in the thumbnail, but it's adding something to it. You know that it's going to be a five step framework that you are getting into, right? We go into, again, back to setting expectations. Expectations are set. You know, if you click on this, you're going to learn how to be a successful real estate agent and you're going to learn it in probably a tangible five-step framework. You know what you're getting into, and if that's what you're into, you're more likely to click. Do you kind of see the the difference there? Yeah, yeah. I actually, yeah, so, I mean, all these thumbnails that you're looking on at the screen, I mean, they kind of, I tried to kind of emulate the learnings from, from your videos. 
I mean, I, how would you roast? Like if I ask you to roast my latest title and thumbnail, the, you know, the thumbnail says good looks are killing your real estate career. And the title is how I made it to the top 4% of real estate agents. Yeah. If, if I were, if I were to roast this one, um, obviously you are taking from a similar structure as diary of a CEO. Um, not that you should never do that, but just so you know, you know, it's like whenever you copy or emulate someone else, like the peak of what you'll ever be able to get is, you know, maximum less than what they have, right? You'll, you'll never be better at being the original than the original is. And so I was like, it, it's, it's a great way to like learn and start to understand what you like and don't like and what fits and doesn't fit and what works and what doesn't work. But eventually you'll want to come up with your own style or format that works for you as opposed to that. So that's like one thing. Two, the guy's face isn't fully there. You get a little bit of it. It's not a very high quality image as well. Um, you, you know, even his glasses are kind of cut off. So it's like, he's not, uh, like the picture of him isn't really adding a lot when it comes to the click of it. I want to probably be a little bit more zoomed out. Um, I love having microphones if you can in there as well. So you can indicate that it is an interview. Also in terms of like the, the, the thumbnail text, text, good looks are killing your real estate career. That's, I mean, that's controversial. So if you want the controversial click, you can go for it. Um, but the word there, I wouldn't, I would not highlight the word real estate. I'd highlight the word killing because that's like the power word here, right? You're already getting real estate from the the title. You don't need to draw more attention to it. Good looks are killing your real estate career. That word killing is like the more powerful one. So that that should be the one that's highlighted there. What about the title? How I made it to the top 4% of real estate agents. Uh, I probably wouldn't say how I made it to the top 4% of real estate agents because like, I mean, it, it's, it's an interview. Like I, I understand that it's, like coming from his perspective. Um, but I, I probably say like, you know, some, something along the lines of like how to get ahead of 99% of real estate agents, right. Or like some, some more, more like a how to, as opposed to a, how I did this just for this particular format. Um, top 4% also isn't a particularly sexy number. Um, if it's accurate, that's cool. But also it's like, people don't really care about top 4% very much, um, versus like top 1% or like above nine, like, or beating 99% or beating, I guess like 97%, nine, nine, 97 for some reason hits a lot for some reason. Um, but of course, like, you know, you, 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 you don't want to lie. So like if he is in the top 4% and specifically top 4%, um, then maybe like how, like how to actually make it to the top 4% of real estate agents, uh, words like, like actually, um, also help with driving curiosity because then it's like sets the bar between what commonly works and what actually works you know like what people say versus what actually works people tend to be driven to that um but yeah i don't love the four percent and i don't love the how i made it for this particular thing that's Interesting. a very valuable advice yeah. we're gonna <laughs> incorporate all of this um so actually so going back to diary of a ceo now their titles are unusually long yes um do you do you know the thought process behind why they're doing that? I don't, honestly. Um, I think like it, it is important to know that like, hopefully what they ho hope, hopefully they're able to, uh, achieve in the part that is visible, like the most useful thing. Right. And so it's like, okay, number one, couples therapist. This, is, this statistically is the best age dot, dot, dot. Um, uh, like it is enough of a curiosity driver so like if you wanted to learn more you might want to like scroll your mouse over it to just like read the tool tip that comes up after that um to the best age to what uh, maybe it's not coming up for you that's interesting uh no, I, it is, it's just not showing oh, up in the okay in the got it cool. um so like i personally don't like this type of title structure especially for interviews i think for 
different types of niches like for, for for vlogs for instance right you 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 can get away like more like lifestyle type of content you can get away with like longer uh thumbnail not longer titles because it's more expected within that niche and it doesn't really hurt your clickability that much as long as you get like the main thing in the beginning um and some people like the extra information but personally i look at this and i'm like i don't love these titles if i were to talk just to to steven i'd be like hey bro we, we got to talk about your 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 titles here but i mean i i also know that that they do do a lot of testing and so perhaps they found that like these tend to work best for them um but i'd have to see the data in order to like really understand why they're going for it yeah i so there's I don't know if you know this, but there's um, a Chrome plugin that tells you how often um, a, a, a thumbnail was changed or, or a title was changed. And it, right. it shows you in a, on a timeline. And I was looking at one of their uh, videos and it was they changed like in, in the first 10 days or so, they changed the title and thumbnail like 17 times. Mm -hmm. which to in my head is like crazy. I know it's easy to change for them because all they're doing is just updating the text. But uh, that level of testing is absolutely bonkers. How often do you change your title and thumbnails after it's published? Um, Not very often. No normally, I try to do as much as I can to make it uh, like to make it good when it first goes out. Um, also, I I also know like I'm I'm a bit untraditional here in that I know that a lot of my previous titles and thumbnails are not great, or at least not to the standard that I want it to be. But I choose to not change them because I want them to be there. Um, because I, I I like transparency and it's like, okay, sure, I could get more views, but also I like the fact that like they're there so people can look past and like understand like my growth and my, my journey over time. So I like keeping those there in general so people kind of like see that. Um, so I could go back and change all of them now, but I decide not to, um, cause like, I think it's so cool. Like it started off in my old apartment with a completely different background and like, what was I doing? And then I tried out yellow lighting once and that was not a good look. And then I set it all in blue and I was like, oh, hey, starting to like a different corner. And then, uh, and then I tried other types of thumbnails with like featuring other people and I was like, eh, it didn't do very well. And then I keep scrolling. Um, and then it's like, okay. I moved to my current one. You can actually like, see how different my current background is versus when I first furnished it with a giant snake plant here. Uh, and just like over time, things were different. And I, I think that's a really cool journey to see like overall thumbnail style evolve. Um, the the ones that I have changed, um, the How Mr. Beast Solve YouTube, the title on that used to be How Mr. Beast Solve YouTube Retention. Um, and I changed it to How Mr. Beast Solve YouTube after a little bit because I thought the word retention was a little bit too specific or niche. Like maybe not everyone who's, who wants to grow on YouTube knows what the word retention is. Um, and they'd be more attracted to how Mr. Beast solve YouTube. So that is something that I did change. Uh, I would probably change five secrets pro YouTubers use to hook you, but it's like, I think that's bad. I, I, I think that that's a perfect example of like me trying to copy someone else. This was like f f film booth structure and like, a title and the thumbnail format. It's like a perfect example of me trying to emulate someone else and it just not really hitting and not really working very, very well. Um, and I, I'm again, non-traditional in that. I like to keep those things here just as like learning moments for people. Yeah. Makes sense. What kind of testing do you do on titles and thumbnails? Yeah. So I'll say for one, it, it always depends on like what the purpose of the video is. Um, if, if we look at like the, the most recent, let's say three videos of mine, right? It's like, okay, um, two of them are what I consider to be like the goal is for it to be a, a banger video. I want those videos to get as many views as possible. Like that is the goal of those videos. Now, not, not, as many views at all costs, like to a degree, like I want the people to come in to be quality viewers. I want them to enjoy the style of content. I'm not going to like sacrifice 
what I believe in and what I like in order to get views. So like within certain parameters, but the goal is to top a funnel, get more people into channel. Um, and my most recent one is very different. That was not like those videos at all. The goal for that one is to connect with my current audience on a deeper level. So my, my metric for success there was not overall views, but instead, what do the comments look like? And it's really interesting because if you look at the ratio of comments to views on that channel, it's like on that video, it's incredibly high. So many comments, you know, came in on that video, which was my goal. And when it comes to like, what do I look at to change? If the goal, it kind of, it depends on what my metrics for success are. If it is a connection video, like my most recent one, it's like, okay, if I'm not getting any views, if I'm not getting any comments or very, very little comments, I might consider changing. Um, and it's also something where I also know that things can change over time, right? It's like YouTube will constantly test your stuff with different audiences. And like, I, I, I've had that, I, I've had that happen a couple times before, right? Like my How Mr. Beast Stall YouTube video is now my second most viewed video on my channel. For the first like, I don't know, two to three months of its, of, it, of its I guess, yeah, of, of its existence, nothing. Like it had maybe 3K views. And then I changed pretty much nothing. I, I did change the, the title, but even so, there's like a little bit of an increase and then almost nothing until boom, it's shot up later. So it happens all the time where like YouTube can find something and understand that like uh, it just hasn't been showing it to the right audience yet, but it can continue trying new audiences and it can blow up in the future. So that's also something to, to keep in mind too of is, it, is the low view count really a problem? I guess like backing up. Uh, sorry, I'm going all over the place here. Uh, in terms of diagnosing why a video is underperforming for you, there could be a couple of reasons. One, the base idea could be a bad idea. That's a really tough one, right? Because people come in, it's like, okay, well, I have this idea. I made this video, and in retrospect, it's probably not a great idea. It's probably it's not that widely appealing. It's not that interesting. It's not that remarkable. Uh, or like the execution of the video just isn't that good. It wasn't my best. Like that could just be a reason why the video didn't do well. Changing the, if the, the packaging of it might help, but probably won't do anything because it's really a problem with the base idea. Then sometimes a the problem could be the title and or the thumbnail. So the packaging could be the problem here. Um, or the problem could also just be, hey, YouTube's been showing it to the wrong audience so far. And if you give it enough time, it'll do well. It's a lot easier to to say it'll do well later if you already know what you're doing enough to be confident in that you're making a you're doing a good job enough already. I'd say for most beginners, there's probably an issue with your packaging. Um, so I guess like if if the goal of the videos is to be a banger video, so it is to grow a lot, and you are confident that your idea was a good idea, and that your video was a good video and you're still not getting the views and you have a pretty good idea that like the 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 video is being served to your right demographic um so it's like okay like is the gender bright breakdown the one that you you're looking for the age breakdown the one that that you're looking for are your existing comments the ones that you are looking for and that's true then you could probably look at your title and thumbnail and be like okay sure this there's a problem here I've diagnosed it to be this. Let's see what I can change. Um, and normally, I like to look at things within a couple of different inter intervals. I like to I like to look at things um, one hour after it goes live to see like okay, like what are like the initial metrics that come in? How is it comparing to other videos? I, I like to I like to look at it around three hours after. Um, normally, I won't change anything unless I see like CTR is super 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 bad and it's not being shown to a lot of people because naturally in my, my, my favorite tool tip on YouTube is like when next to your CTR, it's a little CTR and there's like a little like uh, green and white bubble and you, and you can, you can click on it and it's like uh, YouTube is pushing out your video to more people than usual. A lower CTR is expected and not affecting your views. I love that. Right? So like, okay, yeah, if it pushes out to more people, it's experimenting more. It doesn't take a lower CTR into effect when it comes to pushing more people out. Cool. Do not change your title and thumbnail. You're fine. But if your CTR is super low, like way lower than your average, 
and it's within like the first three hours, like that's not great news. In general, your CTR should be higher when it first comes out because it's coming to the people who know you best, right? Those are your existing subscribers. If your existing subscribers are not clicking on it um, and it's really, really low, then you probably would want to change something either with the title and thumbnail. <sighs> That's right. a really long answer. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. No, I think it's all, all valuable information. Um, so so for, for the How Mr. B Solved YouTube video, um, you mentioned that it all of a sudden you started getting more views I'm curious to know, were the views coming from search traffic or no. were they coming from browse, browse. features? Browse. I see. Because I in my in a, in my head, I always thought that the browse features, you you only get that traffic for the first few days or or first few weeks. And then if if the video dies after that, then it's there's no chance. So that's no. not true. No. Hmm. Because so, so like I'll, I'll say to 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 put this in con like everything you have to view everything within context right and so the context of that video doing well you can see it is uh, a little over a month I think older than my how to make a killer YouTube intro video so my my my, my intro one I released first nine days it was like okay and then it phew, took off right um so first of all intro video took nine days for it to take off. So that's like one thing. Um, I mean, it was still doing well. So like maybe like two of 10, but it didn't really like take off, right? It was still like hovering around a thousand views um, until day nine. Day nine hit, it started taking off. It continued to take off. And then it was like maybe a month after that video had started taking off that the How Mr. B Solve, Solve YouTube one started taking off as well. Um, and it's like, okay, it makes sense, right? A lot of people came to my channel and watched the intro video and really liked that. Late, um, people may have seen my my stuff, clicked that, liked it, go to like went into my channel and clicked on another video that, that, that they thought would be interesting. Maybe a lot more people started to click on the How Much Do We Salt of YouTube one. And then maybe YouTube saw that and was like, hey, well, now everyone else who saw her, her YouTube intro one maybe they would also like this one and started to push that one out to all of them. Um, and then you get into like lookalike audiences too, because then you kind of, YouTube sees a lot of people who look like this in terms of like what their, like what their viewing patterns are and what their demographics are and all of that are liking this video. Let's see if other people who are kind of like that would also like this type of video. And so there's like lots of tests being done here with videos over time. Now, sometimes like, like the most commonly that you'll see this is like when one video takes off a lot of other ones will start to take off too which is why it's really important to have like a back catalog of things and even though it can be really disheartening to be like oh i'm post posting all these videos and i think they're good but they're not getting any clicks and this just really really sucks it could help knowing that well in the future if one of your videos takes off and other ones are similar in quality enough people can go back and those older ones can start to take off as well. Yeah, that's that's yeah. very good advice because I, I'm sure like a lot of um, new YouTubers who are just starting out and they, you know, there is like, they almost give up after like five or 10 videos, but because they're like thinking in their head, oh, none of them worked. But uh, if any of the future videos goes viral, then there's still hope for the previous videos. Yeah, I mean, like, and if we're being realistically, if, if we're being realistic here, most people who've released five to ten videos, their videos probably just aren't good. Like that, that, that doesn't mean that it's all worthless, but it means that hey, you should be learning. Your first video should be different from your tenth video. If those are the exact same and you're not getting any hits, like, there's probably a signal here that something that you're doing isn't working. You need to look a little bit deeper into like are my ideas very quality, right? Are they broadly appealing enough and interesting and remarkable enough to have the potential to go viral in the first place? Are my titles and thumbnails very, very clickable? Like, are, are, are do the videos themselves have high quality, right? Like really, and like, if all of those things are true or you think that they're true and you're still not getting hits, it's like, well, are you sure? You've only made 10 videos in your YouTube career. Are you sure that you have everything so figured out? Usually the answer is no. 
Uh, and so I was like, if you if you can continue to identify things to improve upon, even if they're small things, like, hey, this time I'm going to really focus on the best audio quality I possibly can. Hey, th this time I'm going to focus on my lighting. This time I'm going to focus on like adding music and sound effects in a way that like really enhances the flow of the video, right? Because it's something small to increase every time. If you do that, your first video should be different to your 10th video, should be different from your 20, 20th video and so on and so forth. And then as you get, as you get better, then the chances of one of your newer videos taking off is a lot higher. And hey, probably your first video won't take off because in retrospect, it's not a great video, but maybe some of your other recent ones that you poured a lot of effort into and that you think are really good may actually be good, at least as good as one that went viral. And then those will be the ones that start to take off. So everything like in the context of like, yes, it could be the algorithm that hasn't found your audience yet. And it could also be your videos just aren't quality enough yet. And the answer to both of those things is keep making videos and keep making better videos. Right. Do you do you ever delete or would you ever recommend deleting older videos? Or that, unlisting. Yeah. Or yeah, unlisting once you know that they are not high quality. I personally wouldn't myself just because, again, I think it's cool to like see that journey there and just like just have that documented. I like I like the fact that people can go and see an old video. And I like the fact that I kind of cringed at my older videos and be like, oh, well, what was I thinking? Because I think it's like, it's cool for people to be able to see that and know that they're they're not alone. Um, the only time I would consider privating or unlisting a video um, myself is if there was a video that blew up or is in the process of blowing up that you know has nothing to do with the direction that you want your channel to be in. Um, that happened to me in my first channel, my old channel. I'm not, not now like I didn't really know what my niche was about in general. So when a video about NFTs that I made went viral, I thought I should maybe pivot to this because that's what's doing well. In retrospect, I definitely shouldn't have. And if I knew what I knew now, I would have taken down that video as soon as it started blowing up because like if a video blows up and a lot of people come into your channel because of that video, your audience makeup is different now. And what your audience wants is more things like that video. So if you know for, for certain you don't want to make videos like that type of video forever or even things related to that video forever, then that's when I would delete or take down or unlist an old video. For that video, you're saying you should have taken it down. Is that because you just weren't interested enough in NFTs to want to dedicate the whole channel to it? Absolutely. Like I made that first video because I was somewhat interested, right? It was late 2021. Everyone was talking about NFTs. People loved them or people hated them, but no one could tell me what they were. I believe that the best way to learn is by doing. So I made an experimental NFT collection just to, like see what all the hype was about. Through the process, I made a lot of mistakes. I didn't know what gas fees were. It was like a whole, a whole nightmare. Um, but I learned a lot from the process. And I made a video about that, about my experience. And it's like, and that, and that video ended up blowing up. Now, my own personal curiosity and interest for this topic was done. I had a small itch. I scratched it. I was not interested in the topic any further. But I was, I was wooed by all of the new viewers coming in. I was like, yes, maybe, maybe I can keep Niche, niche down to blow up, keep making videos about NFT creation, and then maybe can slowly pivot to something I'm more interested in. It also didn't help that again, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to make videos about. So I was like, ah, oh, a direction is better than no direction. So then I leaned in and then I experienced the worst burnout I've ever experienced in my life and had to just abandon that old channel. So not good stuff. And it's also very, very difficult to pivot especially big pivots for an existing channel, near impossible to do very large pivots, um, near impossible. So yes, would recommend if like, first of all, try not to get in that position in the first place. A question I ask myself every single time I upload right before I upload is, if this video goes viral, does that help me? Would I be happy? Would I want like, would that be good news for my channel? Or would that be a like, ah news for my channel? Um, <laughs> And if it's an ah news for my channel, then <laughs> let's not let's not upload that. That's, 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 that's not a good idea for me. Um, so try to stop it before it happens. But but you know, let's say you've made old videos in the past, you know, from like two years ago, right? And something blows up from before. 
um, and it's nowhere near what you upload now, just unlist it, be done with it and move on. I wanted to talk shorts. Is there a reason you don't make them? There is a reason I don't make them. Um, now, I don't want to have beef with Jenny. <laughs> so, like, I, know, I know Jenny can talk so much about shorts. I cannot talk at all about shorts. Um, I can only talk about my own experience with shorts, and that is it. Um, I don't make shorts. I've tried before because, again, I think everything is worth trying once. And my experience was, one, it was really hard for me. I think I'm definitely more of like a long form person in general in terms of my own style. I like, like, I don't like the super intense, fast paced nature of shorts. Like I like something that's like more comprehensive and longer and more well thought out. I like cohesive packages as a whole, as opposed to like a tiny tidbit. Um, so that's one reason. Two, my own personal short consumption, I... One, I rarely consume short form content myself um, because I don't like it. Normally for me, it's just like a waste of time. So I don't like to spend a lot of my time doing that. But the ones that I do are more entertaining in scope versus educational. So it was really hard for me to think about, okay, what does like an educational short look like? Because I want to stay kind of within the realm of education. Um, three, shorts were bringing me just like, not that many subscribers for the views that it was getting, which is weird because like I've heard a lot of the opposite. But for me, it's like, yeah, I see my long form video and I see the view count and the number of like subscribers that converted from that. And then I see the shorts and the same number of views as like a long form video, but the subscriber count and the convert was like way lower. So it's like, well, it's not really bringing me in subscribers in the first place. And then four, it's so much easier to, at least I believe it's easier to form like a deeper, more meaningful relationship with your audience and with your viewers if you're doing long form content. They simply have more time to connect with you. They have you have like them for a longer period of time, a longer sitting. And through that entire, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes of a video, they have all of that time to fall in love with you and your personality and want to like stick around. In a short, you have a lot less time for them to do that. Also, it's like uh, a long-form video is a lot easier to come back to if people remember, oh yeah, there's this really cool video that I saw. What what was that creator again? They can very easily find that video again and see you and like find you and remember you and subscribe. A short, once it's gone, it's gone. Good luck trying to like, find that again. It's going to be <laughs> so hard to find a short or a TikTok or a reel or whatever after you've already watched it. Um, and then the fourth, fifth, fifth? I forget which number I'm on now. Um, <laughs> it's a lot harder to monetize. And so it's a lot easier to monetize an audience with long form content, even if it's a smaller audience with long form content. Uh, it's a lot easier to monetize in terms of AdSense and in terms of sponsorships um, and in terms of like converting to things off platform that you have as well versus with a short, it's a lot harder to like make a living even with a larger audience on shorts. So I'll rest my case. Jenny, you can come <laughs> for me. Uh, I'd be like, oh, honestly, it works very, very well for some people. But it's for me specifically and my own goals around YouTube. There just wasn't an alignment there. Yeah, makes sense. Community uh, posts. Now, I think you're really good at the uh, talking, keeping your community abreast of what's going on in your life. Um, I've been like, it's almost like, encouraged us to do more community posts at least on mm -hmm. erica's channel which has like close to 20k subs um what is your thought process like what's the strategy behind what to post and what not to post oh my gosh i love community posts i think they're so underrated um they're just like i mean in general i think youtube has a problem with building community it's very one to many it's hard for people to have conversation with each other both in the like comments and even in community posts as well there's like it's not it's not a great system um so it's like overall it's a challenge with youtube however i like community posts because my own videos as you know are very high effort like a lot goes into these videos and there are a lot of small things that can happen throughout this journey that I want to share. And I want to like bring more people behind the scenes of what I'm doing and how that goes. 
and little like wins or losses or learnings along the way that maybe like don't fit with an entire video. So I use community posts to do that and people love them. Like, look at the engagement there. Look at all of like the comments and the, the likes. Like that, that's amazing. Um, I, 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 I compare this to Twitter, right? I have like a Twitter audience as well. It's, are you kidding? It's getting 640 likes on a tweet is very difficult. Um, and I feel like I'm able to better like, I feel like my audience is better, is getting to better understand or better getting to know, you know, some sort of, some sort of words here. They are getting to know me better. That is it. Uh, <laughs> and like through my community posts, which I think is really great. Um, and yeah, I, again, I just want to, in terms of like what I post, a lot of what I want to build into and like even on on videos as well, I want to like build in public as much as I can, right? So it's like, yes, I make videos to help other people create lives they love, making videos they love, but I also want to like peel back the curtain as much as I can and show the behind the scenes of what I'm doing and how things are going on. And in the future, I want to do like monthly or quarterly analytics reports if I can, right? Where like I show you the like my dashboard on you, YouTube studio and just kind of like analyze some of the things that I'm looking at or how I'm thinking about YouTube at a current moment and what I've learned and what I might do differently in the next quarter. Like I want to do more things like this. And so community posts are like a low, a low effort way to, to do a lot of those types of things. Is there a strategy behind how much to post, when to post, or it's based essentially when you feel like it? I don't really have a strategy for community posts. Um, I probably wouldn't do any more than once a day uh, because community posts have a little bit of a longer lifespan in general. Like they'll they'll get comments on the first day, but they'll also get comments on the second day and the third day. Uh, I I mean I think I could do once daily if I wanted to. Uh, I like to have it as like a separate thing. Like it, 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 it's not a big priority for me right now. Um, but if I would, if I had to choose something, I'd like, you know, once every day or once every other day would be nice. Monetization. Yeah. What about it? What is an expected salary or an income a new YouTube creator can expect when they first start out? Zero dollars. <laughs> <laughs> actually re i'll i'll re revise that around <laughs> negative 200 to negative 300 dollars that's a, 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 a bit more accurate yeah <laughs> care to explain <laughs> um yeah, because like when I mean when you start out, it's like that's that's like one of the fundamental problems of YouTube, right? It's like the amount of time between when you first start out to when you actually start to make some sort of meaningful money is so long. Like if you're lucky, this will take about a year. Lucky for me, I guess the 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 first time it took around six-ish months and the second time it took around that same time-ish um a bit more maybe but yeah like if you're lucky it'll get to that point uh for most people like if, if if i think about where i am now like from when i started youtube to where i am right now it's been almost three years right and it's like man that's that's a long time which is why a lot of people you know start on the side that comes with its own challenges like man creating a youtube channel is a full-time job so if you already have a full-time job and then you're also making a YouTube channel, how do you have time for it all? And that's like one of the fundamental issues with getting started on YouTube in the first place. Um, but it's like, okay, in the overall journey, you'll start creating and maybe you'll start out for exactly free, right? You'll, 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 you'll start a YouTube channel, you'll film everything and record everything with your phone using whatever you already have in your house, right? Sure. Maybe as you get better, you might like upgrade to certain equipment if you want to, like a camera, some studio lighting if you wanted to, some like elements to make your background look a little prettier as you do your stuff, right? Boom, that's the, 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 the negative that happens. You don't 
like there, there are a couple of different ways to monetize your audience. One, of course, is a YouTube partner program. So once you hit, I think it's 1,000 uh, subscribers and 4,000 watch hours, then you are now able to take a percentage of the ad revenue that are shown, like the ads that are shown on your channel. So for most people, it's around 55% is what you get. Um, now, it's not 55% of whatever YouTube gets. It's like after a lot of deductibles, then you get some some percent. And whatever that number is depends on your niche. A lot of it is measured by something called RPM. So that's revenue per meal. Uh, it's the dollars per 1,000 views that you get on your channel. Um, that depends by niche. It depends on location, right? So your RPM is going to be a lot higher if your audience is primarily based in the US or Canada versus if your audience is primarily based in India, let's say, um, or Mexico. So that also depends. And But like, I guess an overall average, if people are not familiar, could be like a $5 RPM, right? Um, if you have a $5 RPM, you are getting $5 for every 1000 views on your channel. That's not, that's not going to make that. That's, that's not going to get you a house. That's not going to pay your mortgage, right? Like that, that's, that's not going to do much. Um, so other ways of monetizing, there are ways to monetize even before you get your 1000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours. I say that too, cause like it can take a while to get to 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 watch hours. That alone can take a long time before you're even making a dime in terms of the YouTube partner program. Before that uh, and after that, if you have a deep enough relationship with your viewers, you could have like other products that you sell on the side. And so your, your YouTube channel can essentially serve as like a lead magnet into whatever other thing that you're selling. Um, that only works if you already have something that you're selling or you know your audience deep enough to really understand a core need that they have and then you have the thing that you're going to sell. This is not merch. Like you're not going to, again, you're not going to pay off a mortgage for your house or pay off your, your suit loans selling t-shirts if you have 5,000 subscribers. Like it's, it's not going to put your face on it. Like it's, it's not going to work there. But if you have some sort of like other product, like a, a typical example is a course um, or you know, a piece of software, for instance, right? Um, something that you can build that you think your audience will like, you could start to sell that. Um, another way that a lot of people make money is affiliate links. You can do that before you're even monetized on YouTube, before you're in that YouTube partner program, where, you know, you can talk about like a book or a course or a software or a physical product or something else in that you like and kind of review it or mention it in some way or highlight it in a video, put an affiliate link to it below in, in the description. It's really cool in like for most physical products, you'll get like a little bit of the sale if it, they go through your affiliate link. But what's really cool with software is that a lot of software is a subscription. So it's like has a recurring um, payment model for them. And sometimes you can also get recurring affiliate revenue. So as, as opposed to like a one-time $10 purchase, if they're paying $10 a month and you get 30% of that, you get $3 per month forever, as long as they stay, they stay subscribed. So if you can, I would recommend, if you want to go the, the, the affiliate route, do that with software as opposed to physical products because it's a bit more predictable um, and longer term. And the final thing I'll say, uh, which a, like a large percentage of people's revenue usually comes from in the creator world is sponsorships. Um, sponsorships is when a company approaches you and asks you if you can highlight or talk about their product within your video. Uh, usually that this is best if their product is related to the video topic that you're doing in some way and can be like seamlessly integrated. Um, sponsorships are like a whole other topic, but that's usually where another large piece of revenue comes from. But again, it's like most of these things you will not see until one, you have enough volume to drive enough traffic to whatever thing you're selling or whatever affiliate link you have. Two, you're big enough so that you have enough coming from AdSense to do anything. Three, you're big enough so that a brand will trust you or think that it's worth it to pay you for something that you, that, you know, that pay you to highlight their own brand if in your videos like we'll, we'll, we'll pay you for a sponsorship um so all of those things happen a little bit 
later in the YouTube journey. Basically a long way to say, it's hard to make money in the beginning. It's not impossible, but the money that you'll make will probably be really low until you get to like a certain point where you either have like a really strong relationship with your viewers and enough viewers to make a difference. Yeah. Erica, did you know that um, someone did a survey and uh, they asked all the people in like high school or like first year in college, mm -hmm. what do you want to be when you <laughs> grow up? Right. And everyone like maybe like 70 percent of all young people, they aspire to be YouTubers now. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure April and you already knew this. But yeah. um, so what advice would you give them? Like, would you tell them to start with their first jobs right out of college and do YouTube part time or but, you you know, like it's kind of conflicting because you did mention that YouTube is a full time job. So part time is like not really helping um, towards the case. So what how do you reconcile that? One of the best things you can do right now is try to work for a creator, right? And so like that's that's like a really cool thing that's happening now as the creator economy is expanding. It's like, okay, well, people can hire other people to help work on their channel, right? People need thumbnail designers or editors or managers or even like assistants, right? And so it's like, okay, can you get a job or an internship or something working for a creator in some way? Now it's a, com it's a competitive market, so it will not be easy and maybe you aren't working for a creator but you're working for like a creator agency or something else like that at least like some sort of foot in the door if you want to to like learn more about it so that's like one way that you could kind of go about getting more experience and getting paid while you level yourself up another way and this is important too is thinking about what you want to make content about right like let's take Dr. Mike is an example. Dr. Mike is the internet's favorite doctor. Dr. Mike is an incredibly successful YouTuber. Dr. Mike is also a doctor. Dr. Mike would not have a YouTube channel if he was not a doctor, right? Um, Dr. Mike loves what he does. He also still still, still practices me medicine as well, which is a, a lot of YouTube doctors no longer do. They, they, they usually quit whatever full-time job in medicine they had. But it's like, usually on YouTube, you need to talk about something. Now, if you're naturally very, very funny, you can get away with you know, making more humorous content and that being your thing. Now, I will say it's a lot easier to do that in short form content versus long form content. And as we talked about before, it's a lot easier to monetize long form content versus short form content. So I would kind of like steer away from that if you really want to make like a lot of money. Um, it's just really hard with just a short form audience. Um, but it's like, okay, for most people, it's like, take any YouTuber that you think of besides Mr. Beast. Um, Ryan Trahan, for instance, he started out making YouTube videos about running track. You have to run track before you can make videos about running track. And he did so very well. Like, usually you have to be good at something to start making videos about that thing to eventually, you know, go into either build a brand large enough so that people like you for your personality as opposed to that topic and keep going um, or keep going with, with whatever topic you are. It's really hard to just start off being like, unless you have like the best personality in the world. Like I don't have a good enough personality to just be like, hey, watch me be me. Like <laughs> no one would watch. No one would watch. Now, Maybe a couple people would watch because I, I've built a couple of fans, but that's only happened from me picking a topic that I'm very good in and drilling into that specific thing. So to that point, advice for young people who want to start a YouTube channel, figure out wh where your edge is. How can you even get in, like your foot in the door in the first place, either from like working with a creator if you want to, or pick a topic that you think you'd, you'd want to make videos about and like live your life in a way to get that experience first before you make videos about it. How did you get so much wisdom on YouTube? Did you have any mentors or any courses that you took? 100%. Uh, I started off as most people start off, which is watching a ton of YouTube videos about how to make YouTube videos. So that, that that's how I started. <laughs> um, got a lot from that. Then I purchased part-time YouTuber Academy, which is a course that no longer exists in the form that it used to exist. Uh, that When I took it, it was a six week long 
um, cohort based programs. It was it was live. They were like live sessions in cohorts, and I learned so much about YouTube there. I absolutely loved it. It was huge for me. Um, that was like one one of the like the the catalyst I would say to all of this. Um, learned a ton from that. That got me into pretty high point until I eventually plateaued. After that, other things that really helped was one, um, forming my own mastermind of other YouTubers. Uh, that's been super huge. We, we get together every single week for two and a half hours um, and just dive super deep into YouTube and cr critique each other's work and assign each other homework. It's a very fun and wholesome time and I absolutely love them. It's really cool because you know, one person will learn something and bring it to the rest of us instead of like, you know, let's say instead of learning one thing per week, you're learning four things per week because everyone comes with something that they learn and you get more feedback on your stuff to get better. So that's been another huge catalyst to getting better. Um, another thing I've done that was huge for me, which is a little bit, a little bit counterintuitive. Um, one piece of advice that I was told when I took PTYA was, you know, outsource the things that you don't like as much as soon as possible. And one thing that they really recommended you outsource is editing because editing can be a big bottleneck for people. It takes a lot of time to edit. So it's like, man, you're spending all this time editing when you could be working on more videos. And so I followed that advice. I did outsource to an editor. And going to this new channel after a few weeks, I took back my, my own editing. And you'll probably be able to see if you're if you look close enough, like which which videos were edited by, by an editor versus which ones were edited by me again. And taking back my own editing, yes, I do more work now, but I've been able to learn so much more because of the tighter feedback loops. So I'm able to learn something new and then I'm able to implement it myself in a video. And then I'm going to like through the process of trying to implement, I learn what I like, what I don't like, what I can do, what I can't do. And so my style has evolved so much faster and gotten to a place where it's so much more unique and so much better because I've taken back my own editing again. Now, I don't know if I'm going to outsource again. I might outsource my editing again way in the future after I have a very specific video style that I like. Um, and I know that's not going to change very much after that. But I think like I was able to push back a pretty push through a pretty big plateau because I took back my editing again and was able to like get to have those, those tighter feedback loops and, and implement more new things that I learned as they came to me, as opposed to trying to like, communicate them with an editor and not really getting across. Wait, I'm trying to understand. So you intentionally took back editing or was it because yeah. you were in between editors kind of thing? No, I, I, I intentionally, I was like, hey, I wanna edit my own videos again. Interesting. That's kind of like contrary to the general advice, right? Yeah, I know, I know. Um, <laughs> For me, it actually came, like, not because I thought I was a better editor than my editors. Like, absolutely not. For me, like, the, the first thing, like, the reason, the primary reason why was I wanted to go ballistic on my pace of uploads. I felt like I had hit a plateau. I was uploading once a week. I wasn't really getting anywhere. So I was like, screw this. I And that's, like, when my my 90-day monetization challenge started. I'm like, I'm going to do whatever it takes to get monetized within 90 days. And part of my initial strategy was uploading three times a week. Like, truly, what is what I call my minimum viable video? Like, how much can I do in, for me, it was two days, right? So, so one day, I did script, film. The next day, edit. The next day, upload. I did script, film. Next day, edit. Right? Like, how much can I do just like this? And in order for that to happen, I needed to do my editing again because the time it took for me to get stuff to my editor and then to get it back and then to like get, provide feedback and then get, get it back, that turnaround time was too long for me to be able to, to do my strategy. So I was like, hey, for these 90 days, I'm going to do it myself. And then I never looked back because I realized that like as I continued to do that, I started like my rate of learning just completely accelerated. And why would I go back after I realized like, man, so much of my success has come after that because of the fact that I'm able to do all my own editing now and implement everything that I'm learning. Could, could it also be that you just needed a better editor? No, actually. My, I mean, my, 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 my editor was, was quite good. They were very, very good. I think like also my, my entire, the, the entire way I thought about my videos changed 
when I took back my editing as well. Because as opposed to thinking of like, okay, I do this, I film stuff, and then my editor edits, and then it's the final product. I really started thinking about my final product, like as I was scripting. And I started to do this, like this other stage where as I would script, I would think about what's happening on screen during each of these elements. Then I would have this, this additional step in between scripting and um, and filming for me, which was the annotating process. So I would go through line by line of my script and write down exactly what's going on on screen during everything that's happening in terms of like, you know, is there text? Is it talking head? Is it B-roll? If it is B-roll, it's B-roll of what exactly? Is it an animation? What is it an animation of? What are all of these things? And from that, um, then I like I create a shot list. And so when I film, I film both my A-roll, my talking head footage, where I talk directly to the camera, and all of my, my, my B-roll, like other scenes or things that I'm filming to supplement the visual variety of my video. That's, that's the thing I didn't even think about. I, I, I did a bit, you know, I would be, hey, it'd be cool if we had this thing here. It'd be cool if we had this thing here. And I tell my editor that. But to like the degree that I go through now, no. And the only way I'm doing is because I'm able to think about everything holistically, right? And then when I do edit, it's like I'm able to take from what I've already thought about in the annotation process. But I'm also, a lot of my own strength now comes from my ability to visualize the concepts that I'm thinking about, right? So like as I script, I realized like the viewers are smarter than we give them credit for, right? It's like as I, as, as I script something, I don't have to give them all of the information in my actual words if they're seeing all this additional information on screen. So what I think about what's happening on screen works together with what I'm scripting in my script. But that only comes together right now because I'm doing all of it myself. And it'd be very, very, very difficult to do like this, like that kind of dance of scripting and animation and those working together to tell the whole story with a completely separate editor who's not me. Right. Plus you save money, right? Plus I save money. Absolutely. <laughs> also, question on masterminds. How do we start one? Like now that if you want to start like a brand new one, you already have one. So how do we start one? For me, it started with one person. So is there one other person that is at like a similar stage as you that you could reach out to and be like, hey, like, I love your stuff. I, I think it's really interesting. Do you think we could connect sometime? Right. And like if you guys talk and you really hit it off. Um, then that becomes your one person. That becomes the seed of your mastermind. And see, like, if they also want to do something similar, right? you meet up every week for two hours a week. And it just starts with the two of you. Um, that's how it started with, with me. I had one friend, her name is Stella, St Stella Sun um, on YouTube. She's awesome. A very, a very similar, we, we, we completely separate niches. She does like anime adjacent hobbies entertainment very different from what i do but we were similar in that you know she had just quit her full-time job um after one year to go full-time into youtube and so we were like we were both thinking about youtube in a similar way we we're both very very, very analytical very serious about what we were doing so it started with just us and then naturally as you get deeper into the creator economy and industry i suppose you start to meet other people um either in communities or in courses or on Twitter or in comments or wherever. And I like, I guess, collected a couple more. And now we have our group of four. I think I might want to keep it at four. Um, I like this number in terms of just like how much time we all get to talk about our own stuff. Um, and each of us have very like complementary skill sets. So we all we each bring something different to the table as well. And that's how we got our mastermind. So you don't have to start with like, how do I find three other people? Just start with one. And then if you find someone else you, you think is cool, add them. So there's three, you know, and then yeah. add, a, add another one. So then you have your group of four. Right. I, I'm guessing it's also good for your mental health, right? Since you're like a solo creator and uh, loneliness is a big problem, as we saw on the YouTube thumbnail for <laughs> Dr. K on uh, yeah. Diary of a CEO. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? I mean, a thousand percent, right? Everything feels so much better knowing that, that you have actual creator friends. Um, both is like a touch point for every single week, right? Dur dur during our time each week, 
yeah, we can talk about something specific, like a specific title or thumbnail or edit or something else. Um, sometimes it's just you, you use your time for creator therapy and it's like to, you know, you need to be hyped up or you need to like sort through kind of like a, a crisis that you're having with your niche or direction or anything else. It's also cool because like, you know, we could be in a random day and be like, hey, is anyone around for co-working? And just like put a Pomodoro timer up and just co-work with someone and have like, you know, in the in-betweens, you can get direct feedback immediately. Like, hey, okay, I'm thinking about this for, for, for my intro. Thoughts? Right? And kind of like back and forth and you keep working. So it's, it definitely feels like you have people on your side and like you even have coworkers as you work on your thing. So 100%. And I rarely, I rarely leave my apartment. So very important <laughs> to have like other connections there, even if they're not in person. Right. I know we have covered so many topics. This is like a masterclass that we are getting from you. Well, uh, yeah, this was amazing. We have a lot of stuff to think about now. Um, hopefully everyone listening has a lot to think about, but if they want to keep following you, learn more about you and your journey or how to be better YouTubers, how can they get in touch with you? Um, well, you can follow my channel, youtube.com slash at, that's the ampersand sign, Aprilin Alter. Um, that's where I'm at. You can, I'm also on Twitter, at Aprilin Alter. Uh, that's probably the best place to reach me via t Twitter DMs um, or Instagram. I'm not active on Instagram at all, but you can DM me there too, at April and Alter. Great. Right. Thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.